Hello, this is a recording primarily for the Suffolk Young Young group, although as with previous recordings for that group, there may well be other people listening to this who are not part of the group who are nonetheless interested in the topics and the themes. For the March discussion we're having at the end of the month, the theme is the myth of Demeter and Kore, um, her daughter, uh, which is something that Jung himself touched on um, in various aspects and angles, and other Jungians after him have also gone in to explore at um, some depth. Uh, and it seems an appropriate sort of thing to talk about in March with the, the spring equinox um, coming up towards the end of the month. It's a very spring-related story, so I thought I'd start by doing a quick um, summation of some of the key points in the story and then talk about it symbolically in terms of Jungian theory and so on from different angles and aspects. Um, so the, the general gist of the story is that Demeter is the goddess of the land, the goddess of, of farming and agriculture and so forth. She is the, the goddess of the earth, the grain goddess. And she has a daughter, Kore, um, the young maiden, who um, is, um, well, of unspecified age in the story, but sort of on, on the, the um, cusp of the end of girlhood and the beginning of womanhood. And uh, Kore has been watched and, 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 and spied upon um, by Hades, the god of the dead. Um, he's come up as this invisible presence in the world and watched her. And he has fallen in love with her, um, or if you prefer, in lust with her, depending on how you want to spin the story. And he's very lonely. He's got nobody with him in, in the world of the dead. He's just surrounded by the dead. He has no companion, no, no lover, no friend, no no. You know, wife or anything and he's called upon Zeus he's called upon the various gods in his loneliness and Zeus has decided that he should be able to um, marry Kore it, because this is the woman in whom he is or girl woman in whom he has expressed interest um, Zeus noticeably in the story has not consulted with her mother with Demeter he's made an executive decision in this one, which does, does have a, a significance in the story. Um, Gaia, the goddess of, of the entire planet, becomes involved and produces a daffodil, which is usually referred to as the Narcissus flower, which is, is its um, name in Greek, that's grown up um, in the, the land where Kore is playing. So she's off you know, having a play, doing whatever she's doing, running around, and she sees this beautiful flower and she goes and picks the narcissa she picks the daffodil and that creates a gap in the earth and it's through the gap in the earth that um, hades emerges as an invisible presence riding on his his chariot and wearing his helm of invisibility comes up into the land and there is the beautiful young um Kore, who obviously can't see him and he abducts her so she's just as far as she can tell she's swept up by this invisible presence chucked onto the back of a chariot which she can feel but she cannot see and they descend again through the, the gap left by the um, daffodil they descend into the earth down and down and down into the land of Hades the land of the dead and there she is kept um, you could say hostage perhaps she, she's you know becomes part of Hades' entourage. Up in the land of the living, Demeter very soon realises her daughter has disappeared and she looks high and low for her and can't find any trace of her and she goes as any mother would whose child has disappeared. She is beside herself with grief and horror and, and heartache and it's all just too too much. And she, she doesn't give up the search at the first hurdle. She goes on and on and on, day after day after day after day, searching and searching. And the more she searches, the more she's tearing her hair out and, uh, uh, and kind of consumed with grief and neglecting her goddessly duties. So the, the farmlands, the, the crops and everything else falls into rack and ruin, falls into neglect. And the gods begin to become concerned that all of the, the mortal beings of Earth will starve to death because the, you know, the grain is not growing and so on. And something must be done. Now, meanwhile, down in the land of Hades, well, we're not given a detailed account of what the situation is like either for um, Kore herself or for Hades. Are they on friendly terms? Are they on hostile terms? 
are they they just kind of going on parallel lines avoiding each other what quite are they doing but there is a rule in place which affects everybody not just Corley that anyone who is of the living who is visiting the land of the dead if they partake of the food of the dead they are compelled to thereafter stay in the land of the dead and um, the the hymn to Demeter which recites this story is always one of the versions of the story at any rate um, is a bit ambiguous in terms of how it describes what happened it it's, could be read that Hades tricks Corde into eating a pomegranate or it could be read that he simply presents the pomegranate to um, Corde it's, it's a bit ambiguous in the wording but long story short she eats the pomegranate and thereupon she is compelled to stay in the land of the dead and she marries him and her married name her new title as queen of the dead is Persephone so Kore the maiden becomes Persephone the queen um, and still up in the land of the living Demeter is is searching and searching and searching and filled with grief and sorrow and the gods intervene and um, the, the chief deity who acts as an intervener is Hecate um, primarily because Hecate is not truly an Olympian she is a titan and the Olympians cannot go into the land of the dead with the exception of, of Hermes who is the, the messenger and he can only go into the land of the, le the dead long enough to deliver a message and then go straight back again so Hecate goes into the lands of the dead where she is as welcome as anybody else is and she finds what is now Queen Persephone and it's realized that as queen she she must stay she's no longer a maiden she must stay in the land of the dead as Hades wife but Hecate uh, acts as a diplomat she negotiates explains the situation up there in the land of the living and a deal is brokered so that for certain months of the year Persephone will reign as queen in the land of Hades and for other months of the year she'll go up and visit her mother now when she goes up to visit her mother her mother is overjoyed and, and content and happy and spring comes into being and spring leads to summer and the crops are growing and everything's wonderful in the land of the living but when she goes back down to be with her husband Demeter her mother goes into mourning again and so the land goes into to, to winter basically the crops die off everything dies off as Demeter sits inconsolable in her cave and there is a, 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 um, a subplot going on here where for part of the story uh, Demeter finally gives up the search retreats to a cave and sits there in, in sort of solace and, and solitude and darkness and, 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 and going quietly mad and the gods try to lure her out with the story of the broker deal and she won't have any of it and they send in a, uh, a demigoddess called Balbo who does this very rude dance she's she's jiggling her bits and flashing her nether regions and it's such a rude dance and probably singing a very rude song at the same time that Demeter looks out the cave and sees this funny comic little woman jumping up and down wiggling her nether regions and falls about laughing and that's what brings her out of her despair her depression brings her out of the cave and she takes her rightful place as queen of agriculture goddess of the grain once again uh, and so the situation is is resolved and it can be read of course as many many people do as a straightforward account of changing seasons why is there a period of the year when everything is green and growing and why is there another period of year when everything is withering and dying well this this is a way of accounting for that and that's a perfectly valid straightforward reading however Jung and a bunch of others have suggested there are additional meanings not that the um, nature symbolism is wrong perfectly correct but there are extra layers of meaning that can be divined on top of that nature symbolism so what I thought it might be um, interesting to do is to take the three main characters um, Kore herself her mother Demeter and Hades um, will we'll, for the moment being at any rate park the other characters of Hecate and Balbo and, and Zeus to one side and Gaia to one side and focus on the main three characters otherwise this will go on for hours and hours and hours if I try and talk about everybody and think about what the experience might be like from the perspective of each of the three main characters and how that can give us insights now just as a, a reminder 
a key element of Jung's understanding of mythology is that it can be read at two simultaneous levels. A myth can be understood um, as the playing out of common relationship patterns, where you could look at your own life or uh, somebody else's life and say, well, that person is taking on the role of Demeter, that person is taking on the role of Hades, that person is taking on the role of um, Kore, etc. And the dynamic of that relationship can play out. So the myth becomes a template for human relationship. At the same time, you can see all of those characters playing out internally in one person. So one bit of them is Demeter, another bit of them is Hades, another bit of them is Kore. Uh, and these are um, psychodynamic interactions between the different facets of self. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind as we go through the three characters. We could be talking about a person playing out a, a, that element of the drama in their relationship dynamics. We could also be talking about that being an aspect of one person and the other two also aspects of the same person. And here it wouldn't matter what the gender of the person is. So a man could take on the Demeter role, the Hades role, the Persephone um, Kore role, and a woman likewise could take on all three roles. It's not completely bound to gender, although there are elements of it where gender certainly does become a factor. We'll, we'll think of that as we go. So starting with Kore, who eventually becomes Queen Persephone. As the young maid, she is most directly related to Jung's concept of the puella, the inner girl. Um, for an inner boy in a man, it's called the pure, the pure, the, 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 the child within. Puella is just the feminine version of the same word, so that the girl within the woman. So what she was like, let's imagine you've got a, an adult woman, you'd be thinking of the puella, the puella rather, as what she was like as a child. And even if she is now 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, she has the memory in there of what she was like as a child and that constellates as an archetype and it can re-emerge at any age. If you're having a nostalgic moment, you're seeing some film or a TV show or visiting a place or doing whatever you're doing that reminds you of something that happened when you were a kid, that is the bit of you that starts to emerge, that kind of nostalgic childlike self uh, and the expression of innocence and naivety and so forth. Now. Having just said it's, it's not a gendered thing, we can see this in a very gendered term, that the inner girl is the, the, the part of the woman's life before she hits to puberty. Once she hits to puberty, she moves from Kore, arguably, to Persephone. Now, going with the fruit imagery, uh, and there's a couple of kind of plant fruit elements going on in this story, the, the giving of the pomegranate can partially be understood. Of course, you can't open a pomegranate, red juice goes everywhere. There's two contexts in which you can understand that. It could be thought of as symbolic of, of first menstruation. The, the opening of the pomegranate, the blood comes out. This is the first time Kore menstruates. Her body is changing from that of a prepubescent girl into a pubescent woman. So there is that kind of symbolism going on there which obviously wouldn't apply to a man in that context, that one men obviously go through puberty, but not in terms of bleeding, you go through it in other contexts. Um, it can also, a little bit graphic, um, be understood as the breaking of the hymen. Now, some cultures around the world have put, and continue to put, tremendous emphasis on female virginity, to the point where in some cultures it's been a, a practice that at the, um, what should we say, the, the culmination of the wedding feast, when the couple have gone to their private quarters, the, the husband will turn up and show the sheet, the bed sheet, with the blood stain on it, to, to demonstrate to the crowd of relatives and, and you know, what have you, that his wife was, until five minutes earlier, a virgin, and that her hymen has now broken, she has bled because of the sexual act. Um, obviously, she, she's been bleeding through menstruation, um, hopefully she is, <laughs> unless you've got a really dodgy um, marriage going on there, pre you know, kind of paedophile marriage, but she's old enough to be menstruating, so she, she's already been bleeding in that context, but she's now additionally bleeding in the context of the breaking of the hymen. Now, as anyone will know, almost anyone will know, um, hymens can break not only from sex, they can break from a lot of other things, particularly in you know, 
cultures where people do a lot of horse riding and things like that, that can cause the hymen to rupture, not just sex. But you could read the cutting of the, the pomegranate and the, the coming out of the red juices as also symbolic of the first sexual encounter between the maiden woman, Kore slash Persephone, and Hades, her husband. Their first coming together, their honeymoon night, and, and the, the, the coming out of the blood. So it could be understood in that context as well as a symbolic element. Uh, and why the pom well, there are other reasons why a pomegranate, but partly the red juice is, is an element of that. And in the life of any um, woman, I would assume, obviously I don't know from direct personal experience, but having read about these things, um, first menstruation and last menstruation at, at the other end of the age scale um, are significant factors, particularly if you are part of a culture where such things maybe are not openly discussed. I'm reminded of a very horrible story about the founding of the Samaritans when um, the Reverend Chad Vada, uh, who was a vicar of the parish, had a family in his parish who were exceedingly strict, very, very, very traditional Christians who kept their children very, very, very sheltered to the point where the young daughter of the family had been told nothing whatsoever about biological processes. So when she had her first period, no one had given her any context for this. She just sort of woke up one day and she was bleeding and had no idea why she was bleeding. And she was so frightened, so panicked, she thought she had some horrific injury or something that she killed herself. And so obviously the Samaritans as an outreach charity for the suicidal emerged from this idea that had that girl had someone, aside from her rather odd family, that she could phone up and say, what the hell is happening to my body? What's going on? Am I dying? Am I this? Am I that? And they could have reassured her and said, nope, this is a perfectly natural, perfectly ordinary experience. Do not panic. She would have lived uh, a presumably full and long life. Um, so there are parts of the world, cultures around the world, where you know, for, for a young girl, first menstruation might be a horrifying experience simply because of the lack of medical cultural context. For others, where they are very well educated and they know what to expect and they're prepared for it, um, and obviously it can, for many women, be an extremely painful experience, but it would lack the terror that the, the young girl that Chadvara knew about experienced. But still, nonetheless, for, for any anybody, um, it would be a significant event in young life and it would become a turning point. So you can see this movement of Kore from being very childlike at the start of the story to becoming queen of the underworld, maturing, becoming a woman, becoming a, a, a person of power and authority and command rather than just a kid playing in the woods and having fun. This is a transition from childhood to adulthood. It's a coming of age story for Persephone or Corey, one slash the other. And in many cultures, it's not uncommon, especially um, ancient cultures, for there to be a change of name from the, the name you have as a child to the name you have as an adult uh, and a shift. So going from being Corey to being Persephone is um, contextualized in the cultural habit of shifting, uh, of uh, taking on a new name to indicate that the adult you is a different person from the child you. You have altered, your hormones are raging, your brain is, is changing quite literally, your, your brain rearranges during puberty, um, doesn't really stop rearranging until roughly the age of 25. Um, so you're, you're going through a set of processes. Um, the alter who you are, how you think, how you behave, but you retain as an adult the memory of the child you in your the back of your head, as it were, so that the, the poella for a woman or the poer for a, a man is always there at the back of mind, even though their brain is restructured, they've you know, got all hormonal and hairy and everything else, they've gone through all of those processes. So that's what's arguably what is happening with Kore. She's becoming a woman. And um, part of becoming a woman is her encounter with the man, with Hades. And obviously there are contexts to this story which um, 
don't look good <laughs> from a modern day political perspective, which might have been understood in a very, very different way by the ancient Greeks when the story was first being told. So this looks like a story of rape and abduction. Old bloke turns up, sees prepubescent girl playing on the on the grass and thinks and abducts her and runs off with her to the underworld and splits her regret it <laughs> you know it, it's there, there's, there's a very sort of sweaty horrible context to that if viewed from a certain political stance and a certain cultural stance which is not necessarily the political cultural stance that the greeks were thinking of a couple of thousand years ago um, there are a number of cultures around the world in which the wedding ceremony often reenacts a form of abduction, but as a, a kind of a play acting. So on an agreed time and date, the the um, groom turns up outside the bride's house and, and effectively says, "Oi, you get down here!" And she comes out, and he chucks her over the back of a horse, or sometimes these days over the back of his his um, motorbike or in the back of his car. You know, technology moves on and rides off with her into the sunset and then they go to church or they go to mosque or they go to wherever it is that they're going for the actual ceremony so there is a pretend make-believe abduction and it's meant to partly reflect a period of history when the abduction would have been quite real and somebody really would have been thrown over the back of the horse kicking and screaming and ridden off with and it would have been basically glorified rape but it's it's also the idea that even when the the bride is extremely willing and really loves this bloke and wants to go off with him that what is ultimately happening in a lot of those cultures is that the the young woman who has spent her entire life up to that point in mum and dad's house with possibly relatively limited contact with the outside world and the implication here is that Kore is very much under her mother's control and aegis and doesn't have much contact with the rest of the world outside that that young bride is leaving the parental home and going to the home of either her in-laws or her husband, depending on his level of wealth and so on. She is going out into a wider social context. And so she's being taken from one domestic sphere and entering another. And in some sense, she is becoming the, the new mother figure, the new matriarch of the new home does depend on whether she has to go and live with a mother-in-law, in which case that's a different situation again. But potentially by becoming the wife, she becomes the, the sort of head of the domestic situation rather than a, a daughter who is sort of somewhere down there on the pecking order of the hierarchy of the mother's home and the father's home. So that, that element of abduction is the movement from one domestic sphere to another, the movement from one identity, daughter, into another identity, wife and one day mother potentially um so there is a shifting of identities in that sense and an element uh, going back to the the greek understanding an element of this is the challenge I, I, if we can quite call it that to demeter that the child whom she wants to go on being a child she's looking and looking and looking for a daughter she wants her to remain a child has reached the age where she can no longer healthily remain psychologically a child. Her body is changing. Puberty has walloped in. And, and bearing in mind, Hades is invisible now. The invisibility of Hades, you could understand as young Kore knows nothing of men. She's had a very sheltered upbringing. She know, well, she knows men exist, but she doesn't really know anything about them. And so to her, men are an invisible force out there somewhere in the world, but she's never met one. And so Hades comes in as an invisible force to her life, symbolic of the world of men. You can also take it, perhaps, that Hades coming into her life invisibly is much the same as all of a sudden your hormones kick in. You don't see them coming towards you. They bubble up as an invisible presence from within. Whether you're a young girl or a young boy, suddenly you wallop to puberty, things are getting hairy and sweaty and peculiar and your voice is cracking and all of this and that is, is, is going on. You, you feel taken over by an invisible hormonal force. In the same way that one minute Kore is playing with her dollies in the grass, 
and the next minute this invisible force is picking her up chucking her on the back of a chariot and riding off with her and as, as most of us probably know uh, and remember from when we hit puberty it can feel as if you're almost like on the back of a chariot you're, you're kind of out you feel a bit out of control your hormones and moods are here and there and everywhere and, and you kind of um, what's going on with your body and your mind and your, your emotional state can feel as if it's a bit like an invisible chariot it's careering all over the place and you don't know where you're going from one minute to the next you you you, you are almost in the grip of this invisible hormonal power so from Corey's point of view that invisible force is perhaps as much inside her own body as it is socially external in the mysterious world of men that she knows nothing about so both at the same time come to kind of conjoin from within and from without which of course is very Jungian the idea that the outer world reflects the inner world and vice versa there is not really a clear-cut difference between one and the other it's, it's a merging of worlds um, but as she becomes the queen she goes into the underworld she she explores around she learns about the land of the dead probably meets the dead um, consumes the fruit and there is the, a question of agency is she willingly eating the pomegranate is she being deceived and tricked into eating the pomegranate uh, and coming back to this puberty metaphor um, the the act of growing up of realizing your body is changing and getting filled with urges and lusts and angers and moods and this and that and the other um, you kind of well you don't choose it to happen when it happens when it happens it's not that you or quite obviously you don't make an appointment in your diary saying oh I'll do I'll do puberty on Tuesday of next week it just happens and so you may feel as if you have no agency maybe you don't feel ready maybe you think oh I'd like to play with my dollies a little bit longer thank you very much but all of a sudden bits are popping out and getting airy and this and that's happening and it can feel as if it is a thing that is done to you rather than chosen by you but there becomes a choice in as much as once you realize it's happening you can think oh well I'll have to run with this I'll have to go with this therefore I will go with it with a degree of choice and willingness and try and maintain some kind of direction or you can kind of kick and scream and try to resist try to go back to childhood try to regress and cling on to the things of infancy and, and you know, no end of teenagers have one you know, on Monday they're being terribly grown up and mature and on Tuesday they're having a, a temper tantrum and kicking and screaming and acting like a six-year-old that they are moving back and forth between child state and aspiring adult state until they get to the point where they're more settled as adults so that sort of do I go with it willingly as a choice or do I try to resist it even though the tide is going to keep pushing um, as, as Jung would probably say if we dug him up um, the more you try to resist actually the worse it gets for you the, the more problems you're going to experience it would be better to choose to go with it go and ride with it than to try to, to go against the grain and push in the opposite direction and, and go in that way it's not a healthy approach um, so there there is a kind of a choice shall we say for um, Kore when the pomegranate is presented does she eat it willingly or just does she try to resist the power within her own body that is pulling her towards maturity and adulthood and each individual of course will have their own decision to make their own experience on that one um, at, once she makes the decision to eat the pomegranate she becomes Persephone she becomes the queen she is no longer in exactly the same relationship with her mother that she was in an hour beforehand she is no longer the little girl she is no longer the innocent she is no longer the one who has to do as she's told and be obedient and, and, and follow her mother's instructions because she's in her mother's house she is now queen of her own house she is the one who will be giving instructions rather than obeying them um, so she's entering into her own power and pulling away from the power and authority of her mother now she may still turn to her mother for advice and there may be times when her mother says do do this and she does it 
but she is no longer in the same expectation of constant obedience that she was in as Kore, as a child. As Persephone, she is, if not wholly equal to her mother, at least moving towards a position where she will become equal. And so the newlywed bride, in human terms, might not have the wisdom, the experience, the knowledge, the material resources that her mother has. She may not be an absolute equal, but she is moving much more closely to the point where one day soon she will be an equal to her mother. She will have knowledge and life experience and wisdom and money and possessions and this and that and the next thing, similar to her mother does. And that changes the dynamic between being the mother of a little girl and being the mother of a grown woman. You ideally become more like friends rather than a mumsy figure who treats their 30, 40, however year old daughter as if she was still five. There's, I've met, met people who do that, <laughs> treat their adult children as if they were little kiddies and it's not a healthy thing for either side of the equation. It's not a recognition of the maturity of the grown child. Um, that is perhaps part of the playing out in this story is the tension between what starts out as a little girl at the beginning of the story and then she becomes a growing woman, a maturing woman, a queen in her own right and her mother has to relate to her no longer as the little girl but has to relate to her as the grown woman, as the queen of the underworld. So Demeter is the queen of the living and Persephone the queen of the underworld. They have their separate dominions, their separate houses, their separate um, spheres of influence and authority but they are ultimately on a par with each other or they will be by the end of the story at any rate. Now Jung and various post-Jungians have spoken about this whole process um, and in a couple of weeks, uh, months rather, a couple of months, we'll be talking about the archetype of the dark mother um, in more depth so I won't bang on too much here but they've spoken about what happens if in a relationship between the, the um, the Demeter aspect or the person taking on the Demeter role, the person taking on the Kore role, if the the growing up is stimid in some way. Either the mother prevents it from happening or the, the daughter is unwilling to let it happen and wants to perpetuate the childhood part of themselves for longer and longer and longer and it becomes unhealthy. That you can either get someone who is 30, 40, 50 years old and still tied to the apron strings still emotionally mentally quite childlike um, and that the mother becomes ever more domineering ever more controlling or you can get someone who runs so far away from the mother that that in itself causes problems so it's not a healthy break it's a, a kind of an escape from prison rather than a maturing um, some of the arguments is that where um, the, the mother is too overbearing um, the daughter on one in some occasions can become um, obsessed with the role of motherhood herself and be displacing her mother becoming the new mother and enters into relationships with her husband or a boyfriend or whoever it happens to be in which he, he's pretty much only role in the relationship is as a sperm donor she wants to be pregnant she, all of her emotional investment is in the children he's just sort of husband is just there in the corner providing the, the sperm, providing a bit of a financial input maybe, but not much else. Uh, and so you've got the potential there for a very unhealthy marital relationship um, in which one person is being used rather than related to. Um, alternatively, this idea of the, the daughter who runs away from the overbearing mother and runs screaming in the opposite direction, um, some Jungians argue that can lead to an atrophying of the maternal instinct. So what you end up with is a woman who has so repressed her emotional yearnings, that, uh, sorry, her maternal yearnings, that she um, refuses to acknowledge the wish for a child. Not that she doesn't have a wish for a child, she does, but doesn't acknowledge it. And it gets pushed down and pushed down and it can manifest in various ways, some unhealthy, some 
just a little unusual you know obsessions with with um, animals or looking after other people's kids or um, other types of creativity which don't necessarily provide the same fulfillment that would be provided if the um, actual yearning were addressed and acknowledged and dealt with so two potentially unhealthy responses plus the third goldilocks one too hot one too cold one just right the the, the healthy relationship where the mother daughter dynamic matures into a friendship rather than being in this suffocated overbearing over submissive um, dominance that goes on so that's an understanding of elements of perhaps what the Kore Persephone character is going through. Thinking in terms of what Demeter herself is going through, she is a mother who has lost a child. And that can be uh, understood in exactly those terms. Many parents lose their children through death, occasionally through abduction, or the child just, just you know, goes out, out the house one day and never comes back and nobody ever knows what's happened to them child runs away from home or gets taken off by some creepy weirdo or, or whatever awful thing happens and it, it's just impossible to imagine the state of grief somebody would be in um, for that lost child especially if there's never a resolution and you never do know what has happened to that child so you can't sort of at some stage draw a line under what has happened so that urge to go on and on and on and on looking and searching and, and maybe having days when you retreat to the cave because it all becomes too much and, and somebody sinks into a terrible despair and the retreat to the cave in this particular story is a, a sinking into madness and despair a, a, a retreat from life it's all become too much because the only factor in life becomes the lost child nothing else not looking after the crops not looking after the the humans or the cattle or you know anything else all of that is, is up in the air and forgotten about and the only factor becomes where is my child there are clearly people who haven't lost a child but do end up in a kind of monomaniacal state where there isn't one issue that dominates their life to the exclusion of every other issue and everything else goes to hell in a handbasket because they're obsessed with trying to find an answer to one thing and they go on and on and on and on, and on about it uh, and if they never get the answer that can become desperately unhealthy and and lead to all sorts of negative consequences um, I, i'm reminded um, both of works of fiction and um, real life accounts of people where they've got a family several children one of them dies and the overwhelming sense of grief and loss for the dead child leads them to pretty much forget about the living children and, and they're just kind of focused on what is gone and forget about what's still there and those relationships become poisoned through neglect through indifference through aban emotional abandonment because they're consumed by grief to the exclusion of life and that's where Demeter is when she goes into the cave she is consumed by grief and life including everybody else's life on the planet is pushed aside and ceases to be an issue um, obviously for a, a mere mortal that is a tragic event for a goddess on whom umpty millions billions of people living beings depend that's catastrophic but even though most of us are not goddesses or gods um, we are nonetheless people with dependence and an abandonment of duties towards our dependent dependence um, can have horrendous consequences for others as well as potentially in the long term for ourselves of course so that becomes an ongoing factor to think about um, and as well as uh, the, the sort of raw emotional loss of the child if you want to see it again more kind of an internal mental process it's the loss of an identity she was the mother of a small a smallish child a dependent child at any rate now she no longer is and even once um Corey is located and, and the, the bargain is struck and she comes back on her annual visit to mother up in the land of the living it's it's not Corey who comes back to visit her 
it's Persephone who comes to visit her. It's a different person. And you, you could almost see this, um, um, certainly in the West, um, you know, once upon a time you were Alice, um, little Alice, and now you come back to visit your mother as Mrs Jones. I mean, obviously, we're not as formal as they were in the 17th century and we don't address each other as, oh, Mrs Jones, how are you doing? <laughs> but um, you have changed your name. You're coming back, the married woman who comes back to visit her mother comes back with a different name to the, the identity she had when she was 12 years old. So there is that kind of shifting. And just as the daughter has changed identity, so the mother has changed identity. Being the mother to a 40-year-old is not the same identity you have as being the mother to a 12-year-old. And, and equally so for a father. It's not the same identity. You are still a parent, but you're a parent in a different context. So part of what Demeter is going through is an identity crisis, you could say. She is potentially losing, I mean, and when she has no idea where her daughter is, she's potentially losing her identity entirely. And even once she does know where her daughter is, she is still undergoing a change of identity, a transition to a different type of motherhood, a different type of identity. And it's not in the story, it's not a willing transition. It's something she kind of has to get used to. It's happened and it's a bit of a like it or lump it sort of situation and we're all faced with things that happen in our lives which are like it or lump it situations stuff happens that we didn't want to happen but there's bugger all we can do about it we can't turn back time we can't unmake it it has happened and you've got to learn to adjust to it or you end up like miss havisham in dickens trying to cling on to an event that's donkey's years in the past and refusing to acknowledge that the world has moved on and your life has changed and even if you don't like that change, you've got to try and make the best of it, so to speak. You've got to try and find some life within that change. And that's the challenge for a Demeter. Can she find that life within the change that's going on there? Um, the use of humour, I said I wouldn't talk about Booba, um, Balbo, the one that's, that's doing the, the naughty dances outside the cave. But um, just to briefly mention this, I'm, I'm sure I've banged on about this kind of thing in some other video several times. The, the key sort of crux of that element of the story is that humour is that which breaks grief, that which shifts sorrow. It's very hard to be chronically depressed when you're rolling around on the floor laughing your tits off because something hysterically funny has happened. And there is a kind of a therapeutic element to this story that... Demeter's very real grief um, what these days we might talk about clinical depression that suffocating sorrow and emptiness is broken is treated in the story and that the, the force which treats it is the the, the demi goddess of, of comedy and laughter and silliness and, and, and naughty dances and the rest of it it's humour it's laughter it's seeing the ridiculous in a situation in life um, and flashing her bits. Let's not forget that. <laughs> you could argue that part of what Demeter is struggling with here is that her daughter has gone from being a prepubescent little girl to being a hormonal hairy woman and that her body has changed, her bits have changed, as it were. So when Balbo is, is flashing her nether regions and, and lifting up her skirts, it's kind of a reminder to, to Demeter that it's not just Balbo who has hairy bits, now her daughter has hairy bits. Uh, and it, it, it's a kind of, um, well, in your face with the hairy bits. <laughs> this, is, you know, this, this is nature, this is reality. Maybe you wish it didn't happen quite so soon. Maybe you wish you'd had another few years of the little girl, but, you know, tough luck this is what you've got now womanhood your daughter's dealing with it you have to deal with it you have to deal with the fact that your little girl is not a little girl 
And equally, you could say in you know, situations where the little boy is not a little boy anymore, it's a man. Um, so again, it's, it's not wholly a gender specific thing, although there is a very heavy gender element to the stories. But it is the, the um, acknowledgement of physical maturity. And of course, not just physical maturity, because there are you know, people brain damaged and so on who are physically mature, but mentally they're, they're still quite childlike. Um, this is an acknowledgement of both bodily maturity and mental maturity. That not only does your child no longer have the body of a little girl, they no longer have the mind of a little girl. They have the body of a woman and the mind of a woman, the body of an adult and the mind of an adult. And so it's an acknowledgement of that transition, that change. Um, the power of laughter, I could bang on about at length, and I have banged on about at length in other places, um, because it's understood in, in it can be understood in so many different contexts. But in this context, I think it is chiefly um, the therapeutic healing context to break the grief, to break the isolation, to break the sorrow, but also the fact that bodies are quite funny. Uh, many cultures around the world have um, no end of jokes about you know, farting and pissing and, and um, you know, puberty and this, that and the other. Physical functions are a source of humour um, to all but the most prudish and sour-faced. And part of being a human being is to acknowledge physical existence in it, its rude bits and its funny bits and its smelly bits and its dirty bits as well as in its advantageous bits that um, as if, if we put it in a very kind of mystical context we are souls in bodies and those bodies have to be understood and acknowledged rather than ignored or you know, get all terribly ascetic and try and repress your body and downplay it and pretend it's not there and it doesn't have these functions it does get used to it celebrate it that's what Balbo is doing with jiggling a nether regions she is doing a celebratory dance of the the um, advantages and the humor and the the, the full kind of plan plan that word panoply of her body and um, maybe it's particularly significant that Balbo is a woman could be a, a male god who came along and jiggled his bits but it's a woman jiggling her bits partly for the reasons I've just said about this is a reminder of what's happened to Kore's body now that she's Persephone but also of course in many cultures including ancient Greece female bodies were quite heavily censured in public um, male bodies to a point were as well but not quite as heavily as female bodies and many cultures since then have been way more censorious about bodies than the ancient Greeks were. I mean, the ancient Greeks had, you know, naked Olympic Games and the rest of it. Um, men could admire male bodies, women could admire female bodies, not so much the cross gendered cross sexual admiration, which was seen as a bit more risque. But um, particularly the idea of you know, menstruation and, and female sexuality and arousal and all, all of that in a great many cultures has been a heavily taboo subject something you don't talk about or you well, i don't want to get too graphic but you know quite a few cultures around the world have gone in for female circumcision and things like that still do in some parts of the world in order to limit and restrict the physicality of the female body um, to make it more controllable and we also have to acknowledge that in most of those cultures, the people doing the cutting are other women. It's relatively rare to have a culture in which a man comes along and chops bits off the female body. It's usually another woman who is coming along to do the slicing. Um, supported by men, undoubtedly. But um, it's a, a kind of an internally inflicted thing. So there is a, perhaps an additional element to, to Balbo, rather than one of the male deities, being the dancer, that it's deliberately in your face about the physicality of the female body. To say, look at it, acknowledge it, dance with it, celebrate it, have a laugh at it, have a laugh at everything. You know, um, laughter diffuses situations, as Freud said. T anything that makes people tense tends to become a topic of laughter because the laughter diffuses the tension. 
So there is that element going on there as well. Um, now, there was a brief bit I didn't mention at the start um, with, with the flowery stuff. Um, I, I, there's a lot of flower plant lore in Greek myth, which is quite a fascinating thing. But um, there is a point in the longer version of this story where Demeter is off her head with grief and goes into the cave and falls asleep. Or at least she's getting to the, uh, getting to the point of exhaustion, let's put it like that. And part of her ripping and tearing at herself, yanking out clumps of hair and scratching herself and all the rest of it, which you can see as expressions of grief in many parts of the world, blood flies, splatters all over the place. And where the blood lands, and this is a common theme in many Greek myths, um, flowers grow from the blood. And in this occasion, the flower that grows from the blood splatters is the poppy. Um, not the type of poppy we're familiar with in this country, but the opium poppy. And Hypnos, the god of sleep, goes round gathering up the poppy heads, crushes them up in his pestle and mortar, and makes a draught of what is basically opium. It's a sleeping draught. And presents it to Demeter, who chugs it down, and falls into a very deep sleep. And it's when she awakens from the deep sleep that Balbo comes along, jiggles a bit, and makes Demeter laugh and come out of the cave. So there is another flower element here, the use of the poppy, the use of the plant that induces sleep. Now for us today, obviously the poppy has the additional imagery of, of Remembrance Day, the armistice, uh, a plant we associate with uh, mourning for the, the fallen soldiers and, and, and so on in wartime, military personnel and civilians killed in wartime, um, which wasn't a... Um, meaning attributed to it in ancient Greece. But there is a, a certain, I, th I think, appropriateness that both the way we understand the poppy in modern-day Britain and the way the poppy is uh, associated with the grief of Demeter in the story. The, both those understandings combine this notion of sorrow and loss and grief and despair uh, and injury somebody you love dies you are injured it's like someone's ripped off an arm or a leg ripped out your heart and even if you're not gouting blood all over the place you have experienced an injury so there is that going on there and Demeter is having to get used to living without her little girl to ac accommodate the loss of her little girl so there is that wounding but it's also maybe going back to this therapeutic thing about the power of, of laughter to heal that sleep also heals uh, I, I'm sure most of us have had situations in life where you feel absolutely bloody worn out with all the shit and grief going on in the world and what you really need is to rest is a, a maybe more than just the one night's sleep you know you might need a, a quite a longer period of rest but to to stop doing stuff, to sit down, to rest, to allow your body, your mind, your heart, your soul, time to recuperate. And so there is an element here where the retreat into the cave is also a retreat into night time and sleep time. Uh, a chance to, to dream, a chance to dream, um, to recuperate. So there is there's that element going on there that Demeter is the bit of us, if you want to go for the internalised, the bit of us that must come to terms with um, its own grief and find healing. And part of that healing is letting go and resting and sleeping and stopping to search, stopping to look for answers, that you can't always find answers when you want them. Sometimes you've got to stop, rest, and the answer will come in, in in its own due course. Not because you've gone looking for it, but it just, it's when you stop looking for it that it pops up. But also the, the, the humour, and I, I think this is maybe more of a sort of slightly pagan approach rather than a Jungian approach, the Balbo comes in from the outside. There's a big focus these days in a lot of therapeutic mu movements that you've got to heal yourself, man. And you know the, the doctor, the therapist is just like a prop stood at the side. That all of your healing is internal. That is, I feel, and this is just me here. I feel that's quite narcissistic at times. It borders on the self-obsessive. And 
one of the reasons many people suffer emotional injuries is almost because they're too independent. They don't allow connection with others. And we have evolved to connect with other people. We need to connect with other people. We need to acknowledge our vulnerability, our our necessity to be with others and, and for us to be with them, so two-way street. Uh, by others, I'm including the non-human here, you, you cats and dogs and whatever, you, that need to bond. And so Balbo has to come in to provoke the laughter because if Demeter just sits in the cave staring at the wars, she's not going to spontaneously start laughing out of thin air. Not in a good way anyway. <laughs> Possibly just before they section her, but not, not in a healthy way. Um, so it needs the external person to come in and shake the situation up. So there has to be an allowance of others to enter in to a state of mind when we are maybe very, very keen to shut down and not allow anyone in because it seems too painful. Or at least the only person we are going to allow in is that one person, in this case the missing daughter. We don't want anyone else. Everyone else can F off. We just want the daughter, that one person, or whoever that one person is in, in the circumstances of your own life or, or whoever it is that you're thinking about. Uh, and anyone else who tries to encroach is pushed violently away. But it's got to get to the point where that individual allows that other people who are not the one lost loved one being looked for, but other people, must be allowed in. That's what triggers the healing. So there's that element going on. Cool, this is taking longer than I thought. <laughs> so moving on to Hades. The invisible man who comes into the story and snatches the girl away and becomes the agent for transforming her into, or assisting her transformation into Persephone. Now we've already alluded to the idea that he is both um, emblematic of the world of men, that this little girl growing up in a rather isolated situation is unaware of, she knows next to nothing about men, so he comes in as a mystery. But also that uh, the, the invisible force that snatches her up in the air, chucks her on the back of the of the chariot and rides off, is puberty. Is so he's he's kind of like the raging hormones. Now, if we think of in this context, he becomes the animus, the inner male, and that once puberty hits, the interest moves to men as sexual beings. So perhaps as a child. You think of men as, as dad, granddad, uncle, big brother, little brother, male friends at school, all thought of in very non-sexual contexts. Then the hormones start raging and boys as objects for romance and having a crush and fantasising, whether, whether it's you know modern context, a pop star or the, the boy next door or I don't know, whoever it is, some some lad comes along, or possibly even a bit older. You know, a, a lot of of teenagers have crushes on their their, their friends' dad or that man. Dan, you know, sort of inappropriately older guys. Um, that that's not an uncommon thing to have a crush on somebody who's older. Um, they become sexualized objects in that sense. They are looked at differently after puberty than before puberty. And so Hades comes in as this invisible presence. Now, there, there have been a variety of feminist writers, some of them Jungian, some of them not, who have seen Hades as this very kind of almost like evil patriarchal force that comes in and snatches the young girl away and breaks up the mother-daughter relationship and he's, ooh, men, evil, ooh. And you can certainly see an element of that going on there. And obviously ancient Greece was a heavily patriarchal culture but I think if that's all you see the story as, you're, you're missing a significant chunk of the story by only seeing it in terms of negative human politics. There, there's more to it going on than just that. So if we think of him as the animus, he is ultimately a part of the same individual rather than a purely external force, a purely separate force. And he comes in. How does he come in? Well, in, in the hymn to Demeter, the daffodil, the narcissus plant, is plucked and the little kind of gap in the earth where the bulb was is the the entry point for this force from the underworld so we've got another plant imagery 
it, bearing in mind this is a Greek story, um, instantly the, the, the Narcissus flower flashes back the story of Prince Narcissus, who is the origin of the flower. So um, for those less familiar, um, Prince Narcissus is incredibly beautiful and totally up his own backside. Um, the most vain, self-absorbed, pilchard going. Um, he breaks hearts left, right and centre, female hearts, male hearts. He's, he's a right little snot for running roughshod over everyone. So much so that he is cursed by Nemesis for his, his um, ill treatment of the women and men in his life to fall in love with himself. So he's, he's on the bank of a river one day and he looks in at the waters, well, a, a pool rather than a river, still water. He looks in at the waters and sees his own reflection and he thinks, oh my God, I'm so beautiful, so glamorous. And he falls madly in love with his own reflection and tries to lean in to snog himself, as you do, <laughs> and goes arse over tit into the water and drowns. Whereupon his corpse is transformed by the power of magic into a daffodil, into the narcissus flower, which does tend to grow in very watery soil. Um, so the narcissus flower in that myth becomes a metaphor for self-absorption and vanity uh, and egoism and, and all those kind of interrelated words. Now, I think it's worth considering that whoever very 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 first put pen to paper or or sitting around a campfire orally recited this story and brought in that flower element was aware of the myth of prince narcissus so when core plucks up the flower you could see that as a metaphor that she is plucking up vanity self-obsession narcissism and by taking narcissism out of the picture, it creates a gap through which something else can enter. The totally self-absorbed, and children can be, especially young children, can be very self-absorbed. They think, of, especially if they're only children, that the way um, that, that Kore is, they, they, they don't even have to compete with brothers and sisters. Maybe the whole world does feel as if it revolves around them and their needs and their wants. And... Um, there, there is that element of self-adoration. Um, a variety of writers have reflected on, on child development and that children, pretty much all of them, go through a very self-absorbed period and most of them grow out of it. Some of them don't. Uh, often that is put down to overindulgent parenting, which will turn that self-absorbed child into a self-absorbed teenager who then becomes a self-absorbed adult and makes everybody else's bloody life a misery. Um, so Corey in in plucking the symbol of self-absorption puts it aside she plucks it to smell it oh isn't it a pretty flower aren't i lovely aren't i beautiful aren't i the you know, most important thing in the universe and then puts it aside and that gap in the soil where the bulb was something else else hades enters in so to allow others to enter in, you've got to put aside self-absorption uh, and self-concern. I think that's quite an important element in this story, although it's a very brief part of the story. I, I think it's an important element that Hades can only come in to those who are not stuck up their own nether regions, who are not self-absorbed, who are not glued to the mirror, snogging their own reflection and thinking of themselves as glorious. Particularly in this day and age, and I wrote a poem about this once, which is on the blog somewhere. Um, you know, think all those people with a million and one um, selfies on their phone. We do live in an era in which technology massively encourages self-absorption and people to gaze at their own reflection and think about how marvellous and clever and beautiful and this and that and the other they are, to a point which is, is quite unhealthy. And something has to pluck that out to allow other things to enter in. And that's where um, Hades comes in. Now, it's also, I think, worth noting that the element of the story, the kind of um, background to the story, that Hades is terribly lonely. He is the only god in the land of the dead. The other Olympians do not, as I mentioned, Hermes on his flying visits. 
the others are not allowed in to the land of the dead. He's just got to sit there all by himself with nobody to talk to but ghosts. Which I imagine might get a bit a bit weird after a while. Um, and so he feels very lonely. And he has called to Zeus for effectively find me someone. Find me a wife, find me a companion. Find me somebody to talk to. And this is Zeus's rather chaotic solution to that situation. And certainly going back to the, the sort of feminist objections, you could certainly level that at Zeus. So why on earth didn't he ask to meet her first? Why, why just run her off, shout over the mother and cause this to happen without any direct consultation? Maybe he knew the answer would be no. And he thought, well, I'm going to, you know, do it anyway. I'm Zeus, do what I want. And, and went in. And if you regard these as, as internalised aspects of the same individual, maybe there's a part of us that makes decisions that other parts of us won't be wholly happy with. And then you know, there's fallout. Um, so there, there is a... a a need for Hades, for, uh, to, something to address his sense of isolation, his sense of loneliness. And that is a need that almost everybody will probably understand, at least if they're of any noticeable age, because pretty much all of us will have gone through periods of our life, days, weeks, months, years, decades maybe, when we've felt very, very lonely. And there's been no one we feel to talk to, no one to cuddle up to, no one to have any kind of bonding with and that is incredibly corrosive for the soul um, however you want to, to dress it up and, and often these things get downplayed and dismissed these days especially if the person complaining about loneliness is not an individual that anybody else places much value on um, then their complaints of loneliness are likely to be laughed off but it doesn't address the issue that they are perhaps dying inside now, some people may be dying inside because they're not making very much effort to meet anyone. You know, it, it, it may be partially the result of their own behaviour that they feel lonely. But even so, maybe what they need is help, guidance, advice, kick up the bum, something to help them move on in life to find some kind of companionship. Not the idea that we are entitled to companionship, but that we have to recognise that everybody pretty much everybody at least wants someone to talk to someone to have companionship with even the god of the dead and that need has to be met somewhere along the line um, so for Hades this is about ending his isolation it's about finding someone who can be his queen and that I think is great but he's not looking for a slave he's not looking for a pet He's not looking for a servant. He's not looking for someone to iron his shirts and, and trim his toenails. He's looking for a queen. Someone to reign in the land of the dead with him. And that is what ultimately Persephone becomes. She moves from being a little girl to being a queen of a massive realm. Not a very fun realm, but a massive realm. Um he is the the agent who triggers off her ultimate move to this queenly state uh, and so he is looking for an equal i would suggest he's looking for someone to sit on the throne next to him rather than someone to be bossed around uh, and that has to be understood in the context of this story that the animus is looking for an equal not for an inferior not for a superior but for an equal and there is a shift in the relationship that between Corey the little girl and Demeter the mother there is an apparent balance the mother is the dominant one little Corey is the submissive one when she moves into relationship with Hades as his queen it's a relationship of equality which I think is something that often gets overlooked in a lot of understandings and interpretations of the story um, because of the focus on the idea of abduction and being whisked off against her will and so on that at the end of the story she is not his his hostage she is not his victim she is his equal she's the queen of the dead that has to be understood in that context um, so that, that, that shift and turn and change. But I, I think I'll, I'll 
I'll draw to a close there. I know it's only a little bit on Hades and much more on the other two, but then the other two are much more central to the story. Um, Hades is a bit of a peripheral player in the myth. But um, as well as being an animus, he is quite a dark figure from the underworld, from the land of the dead. So you could understand him as a shadow as well as an animus. That... Um, sometimes two archetypes in Jungian terms can conflate so if the masculine self or or whatever self gets shoved down and repressed and, and ignored and locked away it becomes part of the shadow as well and so part of the the kind of maturation of the psyche as all of these bits come to consciousness is the realization that something was shunted into the darkness of the cellar of our own mind into the underworld doesn't necessarily deserve to be there because it's not a dark terrible thing it's a thing that can be very positive can be very engaging and healthy and constructive and all of that if it's allowed up into the light if it's allowed up through that little gap in the soil left by the the daffodil bulb it can emerge into light and transform the world often in a very explosive chaotic way like being lobbed on the back of a chariot and ridden off with um, it's certainly not an easy experience. It's, it's not sort of, you know, walk in the park. It, it's Life goes up in the air and, and it could be months, years before it comes back down again and you know what the hell is going on. But the, the transformation to something much more positive can take place. Uh, and so this force that was trapped in the underworld, isolated, alone, unwanted, kind of bunged off into the nether regions, by allowing it to the surface then becomes not the isolated king brooding in the dark being terribly byronic but a force that finds its equal that tr helps to transform the little girl into the queen helps to cause this psychological maturation to take place so i think there is a, a positive ending to the story in that demeter comes to terms and she may not be ecstatic about the arrangement and she may not be perhaps the, the biggest fan of her son-in-law but um, she comes to terms with being able to see her daughter and be happy during those months of the year and, and, and resting in the cave during the other months of the year when, when her daughter is back with her husband in the underworld and little Corey becomes Queen Persephone and Hades finds his match and finds someone to reign with and rule with and is no longer lonely and isolated and, and shoved off into the dark and forgotten about so i th i think that's a positive ending um it's a resolution um not ideal but then life you know for i prefer to meet it's not ideal but then life never is ideal for anybody um we make compromises and we learn to live with what we can get god that's a <laughs> It's a note went on, isn't it? Um, so we'll, we'll end there and um, discuss it in the the um, Jungian Circle meeting at the end of the month. And if anyone else who's not in the circle is listening to this um, would like to chip in a comment or a reflection or, or, or share a story or, or you know whatever, um, please do. Thank you. <laughs>